us when the word, when it becomes more than just the pastor's preaching, and when the Holy Ghost begins to speak. So open your heart today. Let's be seated reverently in his presence this morning. I tell you right now, I can sense the Holy Ghost in this room. All right. Brother Rick, I don't know if you have any idea what happened around here during revival, but there was an opening in the heavens. It didn't leave and it didn't go back to Louisiana with you or back to Chicago with Brother Eric. But God has been doing some things and he has been igniting vision and the heart of his people. You see, we have finally begun to grasp, and I believe what God is doing at Gateway of Hope, is he's saying this is bigger than what you are thinking. That you started out in March thinking that, oh, all we're going to do is we're going to just form another place to worship. And what God is saying is, i got a bigger thing. It's not just a house of worship. It's not that we're going to decorate these walls with beautiful paint and whatnot, but that he is decorating our lives with his presence. And that the presence of God is going to be used in us to touch a world. All right. You see, our theme that we are believing God for for 2013 is greater things are yet to come. And there have been some big things which have occurred in Houston in the past year. Things that, that I have not seen. Things that I have not thought of. Things that were far too big for me even to imagine. And God says, above and beyond that, exceedingly, abundantly, yeah. above all you could ever ask for, hope, yeah. think, or you dare to imagine, according yeah. to the power yeah. that works in you. Yeah. That's what he is doing. Right. Thank you. Here we started a couple of weeks ago and we said that the vision for 2013 was the gateway of hope would be the church with the open door. Right. Not just an open door to so these seats, which that's great and that's fine. I want to fill all the seats and God's doing that. But what I believe that God is opening the door of this church for is so that we as a people will go out and will touch a world that is in desperate need of not another church, not in need of yet another program, but is in desperate need of the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the power of God that transforms lives. God had said, just like he said to the church of Philadelphia, because you have remained faithful to my word, oh, yeah. and you have not denied my name, I have set before you an open door which no man can shut, and therefore I will make you to be a pillar, a place of strength and a thing of beauty in the temple of my God. That when all the world around looks ugly and life is nothing but shifting and sand, that in this place at least, People can find the thing that they are looking for. And what is that? It's Jesus. There's a lot of churches about a lot of things. Some pastor, there's a pastor that told me not long ago that, oh, that was good back then, Brother Rick. All that, you know, I, that, that the Jesus stuff, that was good. But we got to have seeker-friendly programs. And we got to make sure that the music's good. we got to do that. No, my friend, all we got to be about is Jesus. And everything else gets fixed. My music style may not be yours. My worship style may not be yours. But my Jesus can be yours. And last week, we learned that what God was expecting from us, if we're going to be a different church, if we're not going to be yet another, is that God was looking for a church that would be filled with the Spirit. Not just filled with a Spirit like this, like a cup that says, fill me, fill me, fill me, fill me. Oh, give me more, 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 more. But like a sail that is filled with the wind of the Spirit that is pushing us into the direction that He is sending us. I don't want to go anywhere that the Holy Ghost ain't going. All right. That is the vision for 2013. It's a church that walks in purity. It's a church that walks in holiness. A bride without spot and without blemish. One that need not be ashamed at his return. This morning, I want to talk to you about the praying church. The praying church. Father, this morning, now as we go to the bread of life, Feed us on your word. Ooh, yes, Lord. Let us feast, come, and dine, the master calls. Lord Jesus, open our ears today, not to hear my feeble words, 
But Lord, let the words which pass over this sacred desk today be those which flow directly from the throne room of God, directly from your mouth to the people of God's ears. And that, Lord, when we leave this place, we'll be able to say, it was good to have been in the presence of the Lord. We pray these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when you get ready to preach a sermon on prayer, Brother Rick, you begin to realize just how inadequate your prayer life is. Right. And if you sit here today and you say, well, Brother Span, my prayer life ain't all that good, I'll tell you, you're in pretty good company. Because folks like Billy Graham said that was his greatest weakness, a prayer life. Oh, what it could be. A.W. Tozer, one of the great revivalists of years gone by, said, if anything I could do, if there was one thing that I could do over, it would be that I would pray more. Let me add my name to that list. You know, praying ain't easy. It don't come natural. It's tough. I'm a little ADD. I try, I, my mind goes off in every direction. And isn't it that when you get ready to get on your face before God, that's when suddenly you remember, oh, did I, did I pick the dry cleaner? Oh, oh, did I set the Tico for, for that show I got to watch? And, and, and who's going to, and what, and, and all the things are, oh, my boss needs me to, I forgot that project I was supposed to. But this morning, I want to challenge you, and I want to challenge this church to begin to think of prayer life as something different. Not something that you do, but something that you live. All right. That you live your prayer. You see, the word says, pray without ceasing. So you don't have to come to a prayer meeting to pray. As a matter of fact, your life, your everyday walk is a prayer. The saying goes that God helps those who help themselves. You heard that? Nothing could be further from the truth. God helps those who cannot help themselves and who are willing to cry out and declare their dependence on the Lord. Thank you, Brother Ken. There was a little four-year-old boy who was asked to give thanks before Thanksgiving dinner. And so the family members all bowed their heads in expectation, and he had practiced his prayer. You remember when you were that young? Well, maybe some of you do, some of you maybe too long ago. This little boy was, he, he began to think, okay, this is what I'm going to pray. And so he began his prayer and he thanked God for all of his friends. And he named them one by one as the turkey grew a little colder. <laughs> then he thanked God for mommy and for daddy, for brother and sister and grandma and grandpa, for his aunts and his uncles and, his, and, and everybody, his cousins and you, everybody he could think of. Then he began to thank God for the food. Man, it, there was some good food on that table, right? I mean, y'all's table was all decked out this past week. He thanked God for the dressing, for the turkey, for the salad, the cranberry sauce, the pies, the cakes, and even the cool whip. And then he had a long pause. And all the family members looked over at him. He said, everybody was waiting and Finally, the young fellow looked at his mama and said, if I thank God for the broccoli, you'll know I'm lying, right? <laughs> you know, out of the mouths of babes, you know, kids understand faith a whole lot better than us. They sure do. This morning, I want you to go with me to the Bible for just a few short moments. Acts, the fourth chapter. It's another passage I've preached from before this year. Just something the Lord just jumped out at me this week. As we talk about the praying church. If we want to be the church of God, the church of the book of Acts is the one to model yourself after. I don't want to be like the Corinthian church. Yeah, they were wild, but ooh, they had some problems. And Ephesus had problems, and Philippi had problems, and Thessalonica had problems. They all had problems, but boy, Acts. But in fact, I believe that we are living right now, Acts chapter 29, Amen. in this day. Acts Amen. chapter 4, starting with verse, let me see where I wrote down where we're going to start at. Verse 13. Could I get you to stand out of reverence for God's word? 
And would you read aloud with me, starting from the 13th verse. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Let me say that one more time. They recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing that the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and conferred amongst themselves. What should we do with these men? They asked each other. We can't deny that they have performed a miraculous sign and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. But to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak any to anyone in Jesus' name again. So they called the apostles back and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. When Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. The council then threatened them further. And then finally they let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone was praising God for this miraculous signs, the healing of the man who had been lame for more than 40 years. As soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. When they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. O oh, sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago by the Holy Ghost through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, why, do the why are the nations so angry? Why do they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. In fact, this has happened here in this very city. For Herod and Tippus, Pontius Pilate, the governor, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant, whom you anointed. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. Oh, now, dear Lord, hear their threats and give us your Woo! servants great boldness in the That's preaching of your word. One. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Right. They preached the word of God with boldness. Yes. And all the believers were united in heart and mind. And they felt that they owned every that everything they owned was not their own. So they shared all they had. Amen. Be seated this morning. Amen. Over the next three hours, I'll go through this with you. <laughs> so I am aware the Texans are playing. <laughs> but if the game was like Thursday, if we're here for three hours, the game will still be going on. I don't know if any of you watched that, but. I was kind of like, will somebody please clinch the deal here for us? <laughs> In this passage of scripture, the great miracle at the gate beautiful had just occurred. Peter and John had gone up to the temple to go pray, as was their custom, which was a very, it's a very powerful phrase right there, as was their custom. They went to the temple to go pray, and a lame man was sitting there, and he looked upon them, it says, in order to ask for alms. And Peter and John looked at him and said, Silver and gold have we none. But such as we have, we give to you in the name of Jesus. Rise and walk. And a man who had been sitting there for 40 years, who had had church people walk past him for 40 years, who had heard every great sermon which had been preached in the temple courts, who had heard some of the most amazing prayers who had seen all the big names of religion come through and hold a meeting by the simple words of faith of two little itinerant preachers out of Judea who had been following a ragtag preacher who had been nailed on a cross and put to death. That one got up and began to walk and the word says that he just quietly went and took his seat and was very quiet. No, it does. It says he went walking and leaping and praising God. And before long, such a great commotion was voiced abroad throughout that all of Jerusalem knew what had happened. 
the council, of course, the, the Sanhedrin and those who had crucified Jesus not much more than a month earlier were now suddenly alarmed. That thing which they had attempted to contain, yeah. the thing that they thought had finally been finished, Sister Sheriff, when they stuck him in the tomb, they thought it was over and they didn't have to deal with this right. troublemaker from Nazareth <coughs> anymore. No, now there were people who were preaching in his name, and not only were they doing the same things he was doing, but even greater things were happening. You see, I don't think that this little healing which occurred at the temple at the gate, and it's not little by any means, that it was the only thing. I believe there were signs and wonders that were happening all over the place. The word says that, that people would bring the sick out into the street, that when Peter and John and the disciples would pass by, that just their shadow would overshadow them and they would be healed. Oh, yeah. God was doing some amazing and miraculous things, and the Sanhedrin hauled them in front of them and said, You stop. Hush. No more of this. You see, the world will, will put up with everything. The church will usually put up with everything. But when you begin to preach and proclaim the power of the name of Jesus, can people start getting a little uncomfortable? They get uncomfortable. Because Jesus demands something of you. You see, religion says, follow my rules and you'll be okay. Jesus says, give me everything. Give me everything. And we don't want to give everything. We want to give Jesus Sundays and Wednesdays. Is that all right to say? We, we don't want to give him everything. We want to hold on to our habits, to our customs, to our ways, to the things that we like. And Jesus says, no, give it all away. And so they said, you better stop preaching in that name because if people keep believing in that name, they're not going to listen to us anymore. I know. You see, they had they had walked by this guy who had been laying there for 40 years. I'm starting to think he started turning up in that. Well, I don't know why he couldn't get up in one of my services. I, I thought I preached the house down last week. He didn't get up in my service just from these two unlearned men who had been with Jesus. Right. You see, when you spend time in his presence, something begins to happen. They were hauled in front of him and said, stop, no more. And they said, we cannot stop. For there is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. This same Jesus that you crucified, they were bold. He has told us to go do this. You decide and you come back and tell us whether it's better to obey you or God. Right. But until you decide, we're going to keep obeying God. <coughs> the Bible says they threatened them even more. Counts are that they were flogged and beaten. And what was the church doing in the middle of all this? You know, most churches nowadays, if it were found out that the pastor had been hauled in front of court, they'd be holding a meat in the boat and out. That's right. He got to go. That's not going to be good PR, Brother Rick. That's not going to be good for Channel 13 to come and find, you know. We need to calm it down a little bit. We're causing a little too much ruckus. What were they doing, though? The Word says that the church was praying. Now, when you start talking about praying, everybody starts thinking, okay, now how am I going to do this prayer? Oh, our blessed Father, we beseech thee in thy mighty name. Wouldest thou todayest doest whatest thouest willest, inest myest willest, like all oh my goodness. You know, we over-spiritualize everything, and we make the things which are to be so simple, so hard. Jesus said, this is how you pray, our Father who is in heaven. Holy is your name. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right. Give us to... There was nothing hard in that prayer. There were no overly deep spiritual tones. There was no great new revelation given in the disciples' prayer. 
It was just a conversation. What Jesus was saying is, stop being like those who go and they vainly babble on and on and on. I remember the church I got saved at. The Austin Avenue Independent Fundamental Premillennial Baptist Church. Where we were so saved, even Billy Graham was going to hell. I remember we had a brother Michael Lemus, and God bless him, he was a wonderful man, but uh, he had he was very particular about how the service was supposed to be run. Right. And the church was probably about oh 20 times as long as this, easily a hundred foot aisle. And the rule was at the end of the service, after we after we got done singing, 25 verses of just as I am, or if anybody even flinched, we've had to sing another 10 verses. But after that was done and nobody came or everybody was done or we dumped them and baptized them, whatever. After that was done, he would invite somebody to come from the, from the congregation up to the platform. And he would walk down, grab Miss Jeanette, and they would begin the 100-foot trek down the aisle. The rule was by the time he got to the back door and the doors were propped open and the back doors outside were propped open, you had better be on in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That was the rule. And so, one morning we had a missionary who was there. And boy, them Baptist missionaries love to talk. I do too, quite frankly. And I, I could have a future as a Baptist missionary. And so, this uh, missionary came up there. Brother Nick began his walk. He grabbed Miss Jeanette by the arm and off they go, strolling down the aisle. And he's praying and he's praying. And he's praying, and he's praying. They get to the back door, the doors are open, and he's praying. They open the other outside doors, and he's praying, and he's praying, and he's praying, and he's praying. And finally, from the back of the church, Brother Nick yells, In Jesus' name, Amen! The organ started playing. And people started finding out that preacher up there on the that missionary up there on the platform never knew what hit him. And that's what we think prayer has got to be sometimes. Wow. That we just got to make a big old ordeal out of it. No, my friend, prayer is simply a heart that is in tune with the Spirit of God. And this church was. You see, they could have talked about their pastor. Isn't that the normal reaction? When we're in the midst, when we find ourselves in a situation that we are not comfortable in or that we don't like, what do we do? We talk about it. Right. To who? Brother Rick, did you? Oh, can you believe Brother John and, and Peter have us? You know, if they would just temper it down, we probably wouldn't have so many problems. We could probably fill this place up. Did you know that? Can you believe them? And did you see what they were doing? And did you? Did you hear the way they were playing that organ? It was way too... I mean, you, you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, that's the kind of thing that we'll normally do. Rather than taking it to the Lord and offering to the Lord a prayer in faith that says, God, I know that you are big enough to fix this. We offer our own prayer to ourselves that says, I'm going to fix it. That's it. You see, when we begin to handle our situation, you're praying one way or another. You are either praying that you handle it yourself or that you're praying that God will handle it for you. Now, I don't know about you, but I love what Brother Rick said during revival. God's been God a lot longer than I have. And I'm thinking that he can do a much better job, and I might as well go ahead and just talk to him about the problem. There ain't no point about me going to Lori and telling her all about Sharon's problems. Exactly. <laughs> you try not to look. You're supposed to say she has no problems, right? <laughs> we'll talk later. <laughs> Sorry, you know, Side look. You see, in the face of a great challenge, the church went to prayer. Our normal reaction is to talk about the problem, but the key is to whom are you speaking? And what are you saying about that problem, let me ask you. If, you're, if they had gone and said, well, I guess this is the end of the church in Jerusalem, it was a nice try, but, well, Sister Farrah, we knew persecution would come. We knew it wasn't always going to be, you know, peaches and roses, so, oh, and the offering's not going to be good because of the, you know, Peter and Paul are the ones, I mean, they can get that offering in, and that's just not going to go good, Sister Kelly. You know, we may as well just turn the lights off and shut it down. You know, the reason I'm telling you this is things have been pretty good at Gateway of Hope heretofore. 
everything. I mean, God has just blessed them. There has been tranquility. But let me tell you, the enemy is not just going to sit idly by while we storm the gates of hell and take a world for Jesus. He's a good devil. He's a good devil, and he's going to fight, and he is. Guess who he's going to use in order to stir up the trouble? Don't look at your neighbor, but yep, that's the one. He's going to try to use y'all. He don't need no demons. He's got us. What he's going to do? He's going to try to get you to use this little thing right here. That little rudder that Farrah talked about. Boy, it steers a great ship. You decide. You know what? As we talk about the vision and the mission for 2013, greater things are yet to come. Trust me, I have sat there and thought, how in the world is a church of 30, 40, 50 people going to turn a city of 5 million people upside down for the Lord? Uh, you see, I'm not talking about just reaching the gay ones. Right. I'm talking about right. we're going to reach a city. Say it. Yes. Say it. We're going to reach a city. Well, how in the world are we supposed to do that? Why, we're like grasshoppers in the land, Brother Tom. There's so many of them. We're so outnumbered. We don't have all the programs. The board says, have you seen the finances? Have you looked at the budget? But instead, what we should be doing is speaking in faith. Right. Yes. We should be speaking what God has to say. Yes. What did the church there in the book of Acts do? Right. They didn't waller in their misery. They didn't say we're outnumbered. And they were largely outnumbered. At this point, they only had about 3,000. Now, you might think that's good, but they were surrounded in a land that had millions. Right. And there was just that church of 3,000. There wasn't another church with another 1,000 down the road. It was just them and nobody else. And they could have said, oh, I guess we're just going to sit here and we're going to do our thing. We have an opportunity, Gateway of Hope Church. In 2013, we have an opportunity and we have a challenge. The challenge is there's a world to be reached. Yeah. The challenge is, yeah. is that in this room right yeah. now, ostensibly, we don't have the resources in and of ourselves, do we? Right. I, I looked in Wells Fargo's account this morning. And there was not a gazillion dollars. Am I right, Mr. Treasurer? There's not a gazillion dollars in the account. It's not there. I want to keep looking. I mean, you might want to check right now. But, you know, it's not to... Well, we'd, we'd all be shut. He'd, he'd be shut right there. But that's a challenge, right? It takes funds. But, my friend, what would make you to think that the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills wouldn't be willing to sacrifice a couple of dozen of them in order to pay for the ministry of this church? Come on. You know, we can talk about the problem or we can talk about our God. That's right. And when we pray, God doesn't want to hear your organ recital. That's right. God doesn't want to hear, oh, oh dear Jesus. Jesus. Oh, yeah. It's so bad. You ever have people pray like that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they get up and you know what I mean by organ recital. Yeah. Oh, dear Lord. Sister Mary Jewel's heart's just giving out on her. And oh, dear Jesus, for Sister Bertha, her liver is just not so good. And oh, precious Lord, oh, precious Lord, brother Eugene, man, his <laughs> knees are getting out. Oh, and Sister Myrtle, Sister Myrtle, her lungs, uh, organ recitals. Woe is me. You know, we used to have testimony service. Oh, my God. And testimony service would always start off with, well, I just want to praise the Lord that I'm saying, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. But, <laughs> but I really was suffering for Jesus this week. Oh, I got water in the legs. Oh, <laughs> you know which ones I'm talking about. Yes, you, you grew up in a testimony service. Yes. The pastors knew which people not, not to, to call. Right. They might be going, oh, 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 like a welcome back cutter. Oh, and the pastor goes, well, there's no money for a testimony. <laughs> You see, the challenge is to proclaim God's word. See, they had persecution from authority, but they began to practice the proclamation of God's word outside of the walls by proclaiming God's word inside the walls before the Lord. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Church, get in the word, get in the word, 
get in the word and speak it. If you don't know what else to pray, I heard people say, say the name Jesus. Actually, if you don't know what else to pray, just open up the book and start reading it aloud in the following. Yes, yes, yes. Say, Lord, this is what I claim for myself. This is what we claim for Gateway of Hope Church. This is what we claim for the city of Houston. Yes. You see, there are exceedingly great and precious promises that God has made. Those are gifts which we are to claim. You have an opportunity and you have a challenge. The challenge is things don't always look like they're going to work out in your benefit. Right. The opportunity is that we walk by faith and not by sight. Yeah. Therefore, I will speak by faith. What will I speak? God's word. I may look like I'm sick. It may look like... I have cancer, but God's word Amen. says he has sent his word Amen. and he has healed me. Oh, I am not denying right. reality that I have a diagnosis yeah. at that yeah. point. But I am affirming the reality of what God has said about my diagnosis. All right. Yes. You see, they prayed the word. What, when you read this little prayer, what do they do? They prayed the scripture. They got to know what the Word said. It was not a surprise to them that they were facing persecution. First they had heard the Lord say it, but then they had read it in the Word. Why do the heathen rage? And why do the people imagine a vain thing? But he remains on his throne. You see, they proclaimed the truth over their situation. They could have said it's all bad, it's doom, it's gloom and despair, shut the lights off. Call HLP, turn them no more. We're, we're going to shut the doors. Call the landlord, give the keys back. We're done. But instead they said, but the Lord is on his throne. Right. Right. And he makes the earth his footstool. Yes. Right. You see, prayers of faith are the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Yes. And then they prayed with expectancy. They prayed with expectancy. First, they saw the opportunity and the challenge, and they prayed accordingly. Secondly, they prayed God's word. And thirdly, they prayed with expectancy for results. Amen. You know, I'm not just offering prayers just for the sake of them hitting these ceiling tiles and bouncing back. I had more important things to do with my time, Brother Tron. I could, if, if all I wanted to do is listen to somebody ramble on and talk, I could turn the TV on. You didn't have to come here this morning. Amen. Somebody else could just babble on and on and on and on. But I come with faith and with expectancy right. that what I am speaking, God will perform. Not because there's any special power that I have, but because there's power in the words which I speak. Right. You see, the miracle is in your mouth. The Word of God is, if you put the Word of God in your mouth, that's the miracle. You can sit at home and say, I'm so depressed, and oh, woe is me, and everything is bad. You can do that. That's exactly what your life will continue to be. Or you can say, yeah, things are tough right now, but I know who my God is. I know my daddy's got my situation under control. And I am joyful. I am strong. I'm going to proclaim that confession. You know, it's not just another thing that we do just to fill time in the service because we don't have enough stuff to do. Reading this declaration of faith. Well, the we, reason we do that is because when we speak this, this is what begins to happen in our lives. That we're bold. We're filled with love. We're filled with forgiveness. I could sit there all day and remember what Brother Carlos did to me back in 1994. And I could dwell on it and I could harbor unforgiveness. Or I could say, I walk, I choose to walk in forgiveness to Brother Carlos today. Because God has cast my sin as far as the east is from the west. And he remembers it no more, so I do the same. You know, that's the kind of prayer. That's not, that's not all this, oh, we beseech thee that thou wouldest do. No, that's just real living. That's right. That's just real. You know, we need to put this on a, in a plane that we understand. We used to talk about tarrying. And boy, tarrying was all good. But you know what? I don't believe the Lord is looking for a church just to tarry, tarry, tarry. Because if you're, all you're doing is tarrying, you ain't going. <laughs> right. right. Maybe what the church just simply needs to be doing is praying on the go. You see, right. as we go walk Say out that. that open door, as we go and as we minister, it is to the purpose to reach the lost, the only way you're going to do that is if you're filled with His Spirit and His praying, and you have a constant communication with Him. It's interesting to me to note that the world's largest church in Seoul, South Korea, has the two largest right. ministries in that church, is the prayer ministry and the witnessing ministry. 
Pastor Cho one time said when he came and he did a tour of the United States, he said in South Korea we build prayer mountains. In America they build family life centers. And gymnasiums. The church in South Korea is growing by leaps and bounds. The evangelical church in the United States is constant, has begun a decline. I saw when I was in the Assemblies of God, uh, for the first probably 70 years of the Assemblies of God's existence, it was the fastest growing denomination, even though they didn't want to be called a denomination. Fastest growing denomination in the United States. Growing leaps and bounds, double digit growth every single year. But slowly and slowly and slowly, the Pentecostal churches, the Assemblies of God, began to lose their fervency of living a prayer filled life. The Spirit of God began to no longer have the freedom to operate in their services. And you could take a chart, put it side by side, and you can see as the number of people who were filled with the Spirit of God living a prayer-filled life declined, the growth of the church began to ebb. And for the last 10 years, most evangelical churches in the United States have been in decline. Right. You drive by some of these churches that have been built years ago. Yes. Years ago, and they've never needed to build another building. Something happened wrong in that place. Yeah. Yeah. There's a big church down on the down on the Gulf Freeway, when we used to live in Pasadena, I used to see it all the time. And you could see the progression of the growth of the church because they had a little building and a little bigger building and a little bigger building and a little bigger building and then a really big building. <laughs> but you could also tell by the style of the architecture when these buildings kind of were built. And that really, really big building looked like it was built in about the 70s. It never needed to build anything else. What do you think happened in that church? God's been growing gateway of hope. Amen. I would say from nine to where we are today in six and a half, seven months, is an amazing growth. Amen. But the reason that's happened is from the day one, we realized one thing. God helps those who cannot help themselves. Right. We're not going to grow this church with just PR and marketing and by getting on Facebook, but we grow this church on our knees. Right. Declaring our dependence before God and saying, God, we need you. We could have the programs. We got an incredible worship team. It's, I'm amazed. I even told Ken this morning, I don't know who these people are and what you did with the old worship team around here, but these are good. You guys are amazing. We've had great preachers and great ministers come and stand on this platform. But we, that's not what it is. That's right. We've grown this church on our knees. And Gateway of Hope in 2013, we're going to do that some more. So here's a couple of things I want to challenge this church to do in 2013. Number one, I told you that we would do four major outreaches yes. over the coming year. Those outreaches are going to be completely ineffective unless we have bathed them in the prayer. Yes. Yes. Therefore, what we will be doing is there will be four 24-hour prayer meetings in this church yes. leading up to those services. I'm going to be asking you to take an hour to come up here and pray. Well, what do I pray? Just talk to your daddy. But Brother Spin, I don't know how to pray. Yeah, you do. If you can talk to your spouse, you can talk to God. Yes. But Brother Spin, I don't know what to say. Just tell him what you want. He said, he said, if the prayer is offered in faith, without doubt, if you believe it, it'll, he'll do it. As long as it's according to his will. The last time I checked, God's will was that no man should perish. And that all should come to repentance. That's his will. We have a clear definition of it. And so I'm going to be challenging you. We're going to open this sanctuary up. And in the weeks leading up to each of these major outreaches, we're going to make this a house of prayer. Amen. The other thing that we're going to do is coming in 2013, I know we've had our Thursday night prayer meetings, and I've kind of seen those, the, the, the attendance dwindle on those a little bit. And so we're going to. And somebody said, well, Brother Sven, teach us how to pray. Teach us. And we're going to do that. And in 2013, we're going to move our midweek service. We're going to institute a midweek prayer service. It's not going to be for me to get up here and preach you another sermon. You don't need to hear me preach another sermon. you got your Bible. You go open it up and read it. Yeah, okay? right. But we do need to be praying. And so in those prayer services, we're going to come. We're going to have a short time of worship. And then 
we're going to go and we're going to bombard heaven's throne. Amen. And we're going to pray yes. specifically for specific things. So the north, the south, the east, and the west. And let me tell you, I want that to be the biggest service of the week in this church. Amen. Because what will happen in this church in the midweek determines the effectiveness of everything else that we do. Okay. My sermon is important. Yes. But the prayers of a righteous man are powerful and effective. Yes. Not the sermon of a great preacher. We have a great opportunity. There is a big city to reach. And I want to know, what are you willing to do? You see, the prayer that God is asking from Gateway of Hope Church to pray, we sang it this morning. I give myself away. You see, my goal is not, like I said, simply to fill all the seats in this building. Or for us to lease every building on this property and fill every seat in it. My goal is to populate heaven and depopulate hell. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yes. That's my goal. Yes. If they end up sitting in these chairs, well, praise God. Yes. But if they end up going somewhere else, well, praise God. Yes. That's all right. I'll work with anybody, and we should too, Amen. who has the same goal, the same mission. We are here to reach the lost. Brother Ken, would you stand with me this morning? Would you just play that same old song? Thank you for indulging me this morning. I know I preached a little long, but this morning, as we conclude, and as we come to a time of commitment, I've challenged you after every one of these messages on mission and vision, to grab it and make it not just my vision. It needs to be your vision. It needs to be yours. So would you close your eyes this morning in this room? Would you just allow the Spirit of God to tell you in your heart, is there something in your life this morning that He's saying that one thing that you haven't quite given yet? That's what I'm asking. You see, the only thing He will take is 100%. He will not take your 99. He won't take your 80. He wants it all. That's the prayer He's looking for this morning. Would you just keep your head bowed right now? Would you sing it just softer to him?
that requires a full surrender. So the Lord is not touching you up. Start praying in the Holy Ghost right now.
me, saying that my gifts and my calling for you, my child, they are without repentance. You may have run, you may have wandered, but I was there the whole time. Lord Jesus, we love you today. This morning we are not going to dismiss the service.